Well, thank you, Andy. It's uh, good to be here. And let me thank the U.S. High Speed Rail Association for uh, organizing this conference, bringing all the leaders together. Uh, I'd like to recognize Ron, Rod Dearden, you know, who truly was one of the early leaders in putting together the vision for that Core Express uh, high speed rail service in the state of California with the chance to reach uh, those 220 mile per hour speeds. And of course, I think, uh, did I see, I think I see DJ Statler from Amtrak in the back. DJ, you back there? No? Just, just, to, you know, I'm not gonna say that out loud. But, uh, and, I, and I'll touch on it in the remarks, just some of the exciting things that are going on not only to bring higher speeds and better reliability to the Northeast Corridor, but also the work that uh, my agency is doing, uh, that the Northeast Corridor Commission is doing, to talk about those appropriate infrastructure investments that will bring that Core Express, you know, 200 mile per hour service uh, to the Northeast Corridor and get those 90 minute trip times between New York and DC, New York and Boston. Um, I know the Secretary's gone, so I guess I'm probably safe uh, praising him and of course since he's announced his retirement I don't have to get accused of you know just sucking up to him but uh, I, I'm gonna miss him terribly and his leadership has truly been outstanding and you know he, he talked about the naysayers and I've spent a lot of time as I'm sure many of you have uh, taking a look at uh, the history of mega projects and if you review that history you'll see that every single mega project and not just the history of the US but actually, globally around the world, every single mega project ever has had its detractors. And you read the arguments. They haven't been different for more than 200 years. And, and, and when you take a look at these mega projects, there's always that, that one or two visionaries, uh, you know, the champions who forge ahead and move that, uh, that vision forward against all the challenges. And I'm convinced that when the history books are written on high-speed rail in America, uh, Ray LaHood is going to be viewed without question as one of those champions. The year 2012 was a monumental year for American rail, uh, without question one of the greatest in generations. It was the safest year in railroading history. Amtrak saw record on-time performance and achieved an all-time high in uh, ridership. Uh, on the freight side, we saw intermodal freight traffic surge above 12 million units, which is very close to an industry record. With a vote of the General Assembly, world-class 220 mile per hour service began moving forward in California. Uh, in the Midwest, 110 service, 110 mile per hour service, the fastest trains outside of the Northeast Corridor were introduced on two key routes in the Midwest. We've made historic investments in new passenger rail equipment, equipment that's certified to go 125 miles per hour. That's gonna be manufactured here in America. And we've launched uh, the first comprehensive Northeast Corridor planning effort since the Jimmy Carter administration. In addition, we've successfully obligated 100% of our Recovery Act funded high speed and inner city passenger rail program funding well in advance of our September 30th statutory deadline. Uh, last year, 11 construction projects, five service development plans, and four state rail plans were completed. And as good as all this sounds, it's simply a warm-up. This is just a warm-up. The $19 billion this administration has invested in rail since 2009 is building, improving, or creating 6,000 corridor miles, 40 stations, 75 planning studies, and 30 state rail plans or service development plans. And with our high speed and inner city passenger rail program, the next two years are going to be our busiest years of construction yet. We've got 52 projects in 19 states worth $3.6 billion in funding that are either complete, under construction, are set to begin. And of course, the big news is that this summer, California's high-speed rail project will break ground. In the Midwest, in the next two and a half years, trains will be running at 110 miles per hour throughout most of the Chicago-St. Louis and Chicago-Detroit routes, 
cutting the trip times on both those routes by close to an hour. In the Pacific Northwest, 21 projects are moving forward that will increase round trips and cut trip times in a growing rail market that connects Portland and Seattle. And we're also seeing the planning efforts for high speed and higher performing inner city passenger rail service move forward in states like North Carolina, in Virginia, in Georgia, and Texas. In the Northeast, on the corridor, our planning effort is called the NEC Future. And it's one of the largest multi-state transportation projects ever undertaken in the United States. The end result will be a clear vision for how to optimize the NEC and the preparation of a 30-year rail investment plan to guide us forward. But addition, in addition to planning in the Northeast Corridor, this administration, as the Secretary had said, has invested more than $3 billion worth of uh, projects on the NEC for station and track development, for modernizing power systems, for replacing aging infrastructure, and for buying new equipment. These investments are allowing for faster train speeds between Philadelphia and New York, and for the untangling of delay causing bottlenecks at uh, the Herald Interlocking in Queens, and in Delaware, and in Rhode Island. Stations are being upgraded in Boston, Washington, D.C., at BWI Airport, and in New York, where the Moynihan Station project will expand the capacity and improve the amenities at New York Penn Station. And major engineering projects are moving forward, including replacement of New Jersey's Portal Bridge, Baltimore's B&P Tunnel, and the Susquehanna Bridge in Northern Maryland. We've also made unprecedented investments in vital NEC feeder routes, including two projects that have already come in on time and on budget. Last year, Maine finished extending the Boston to Portland Amtrak line to Brunswick and Freeport, restoring service there for the first time since 1959. And in Vermont, 190 miles of track upgrades have sped up freight and passenger rail service, improved reliability, and enhanced safety. But the time savings won't end in Vermont. A project in Massachusetts on the same corridor is improving track and creating a more direct route. And in Connecticut, by 2016, the segment between New Haven and Hartford will be completely double track. So combined, the results will be a time saving of close to 70 minutes between Vermont and New Haven. And as we move forward, as we move forward on all these projects, the case is clear. America cannot afford not to have high speed and higher performing inner city passenger rail. That comprehensive rail system that allows service speeds and levels to be targeted to the needs of the marketplace. Let me take you back to something President Eisenhower said in his 1955 State of the Union address, he said, a modern and efficient highway system is essential to meeting the needs of our growing population, our expanding economy, and our national security. And there's no question that was true 60 years ago. And of course, in some respects, it remains true today. But today, we're looking at challenges like how to move 100 million more people and 4 billion more tons of freight over the next three decades. And so for that, we're going to need a modern, efficient transportation system with all the modes working together at full strength. You know, there's an old adage. It, it, it's fundamental that no economy can ever grow faster than its transportation network can carry it. Transportation is the bloodline of any economy. But today, our highways and airports are stretched close to their limits, and the cost of over-reliance on them continues to grow. According to a Texas Transportation Institute report released just last week, the annual cost of highway construction, or uh, highway congestion alone, now costs our economy over $120 billion a year which equates to a cost of $800 per year to each commuter, and these costs continue to grow. Close to three billion gallons of fuel, enough, enough fuel to fill the New Orleans Superdome four times, is wasted every year. 
And for the first time, the Institute also measured travel reliability. Underscoring the need to provide more transportation alternatives, the study found that increasing amounts of time must be set aside to ensure on-time arrival for high-priority freeway trips. Our airports, take a look at our airports as well. They're struggling to keep up with modern demand. We're at a point now where nearly 20% of all flights are delayed. And as a way of confronting high fuel prices and changing demand, airlines are now making significant cutbacks to short haul flights to small and medium sized cities. So in the face of these challenges, the efficiencies of rail simply cannot be ignored. With service levels that are targeted to the marketplace, rail can be the most cost effective, least oil reliant, and most environmentally friendly mode to move people. Two railroad tracks can carry as many travelers in an hour as 16 lanes of freeway. And the cost of building rail compares favorably with roads. Rail right of way only consumes one third of the land required by roadways. But here's what I call the untold story. We simply can't ignore the fact, and it is a fact, that Americans' travel habits are evolving. You know, there's this old common myth out there that America has too much of a car culture to embrace trains. But take a look at the facts. According to a recent study by the U.S. Perg and Frontier Group, over the last eight years, Americans have actually driven less while using passenger rail and public transit in record numbers. And these changes, it's really remarkable, these changes are happening fastest among young people. In an eight year period starting in 2001, that uh, age group of 18 to 36 reduced their vi uh, vehicle miles driven by 23% while increasing the average passenger miles traveled by rail and buses by a whopping 40%. But it's not just about the next generation. Read the articles in AARP. Uh, I hate to admit I'm old enough to get the magazine, but I am. And, and, and if you read the articles that they print, they've made clear that more and more senior citizens are seeking out communities that make it easier to walk places, use public transportation rather than drive, and have that access to inner city rail, allowing them to remain active and independent as they age. Compared to the uh, decade prior in 2009, seniors made 328 million more trips by rail and transit. And so friends, this is the future we're preparing for. Ultimately, it's up to us to form the partnerships and to build the vast public and private support that we'll need to gradually realize the President's goal. Now, I'm sure all of you heard President Obama remind us in his inaugural address that, and I'll quote, together we determined that a modern economy requires railroads and highways to speed travel and commerce. And I think that line was a great reminder of the timeless value of public-private partnerships in advancing transportation and, of course, advancing our economy and our way of life. Before government and private sector began working together in the 1850s to expand our rail network, there was no national economy. It simply didn't exist. You take a look before the, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad. All we had was a series of small economies, local economies, and none of those economies were any bigger than the distance a horse could walk in one day. But the Transcontinental Railroad changed all that and ignited the greatest economy that the world has ever seen. New railroad towns sprouted up all over America, and new industries with a connection to rail were able to thrive anywhere in our vast nation. And we not only built the Transcontinental Railroad in America, we made it. We made it in America. I, I, I love this little fact. The Pacific Railroad Act of 1864 was actually the first by America provision. Yeah, it required that the rails and all the other iron used in the construction be American made. And so as we modernize our rail network today, we're building on that legacy through our Buy America program. 
which ensures that everything from tracks to cross ties to train sets to new stations gets built in America with American-made parts and supplies. At the same time, across America, we're again witnessing the transformative power of station development and improved connectivity. Due to the extension of service in Maine, millions of private dollars have poured into downtown Brunswick for commercial and residential development around the station center. And I visited with that developer. He told me the one and only reason he made those million dollars of investment was because of that rail line extension. Similar stories playing out in cities like Normal, Illinois, and Denver, Colorado, proof that revitalized train stations are magnets for economic development. Now, I'm particularly pleased that uh, Amtrak and California High Speed Rail Authority have answered our call at FRA to come together to work to explore a bundled procurement for the next generation of high-speed rail equipment, equipment that will be designed to reach those speeds of 220 miles per hour. Through the good work of uh, our safety team at FRA, our industry stakeholders coming together, we've achieved a performance-based safety approach that will allow proven high-speed train sets based upon those existing international platforms to be quickly designed and adapted for use in the United States. And combining these orders together, the power of bundling will incentivize high-speed rail manufacturers to build factories domestically, creating new high-quality jobs and tremendous opportunities for suppliers. And above all, Amtrak and California High-Speed Rail Authority's announcement shows just how far we've come in only four years. Now, there's always going to be the critics. There always is. Again, just go back and read the history on virtually every single mega project. But all the great projects, whether it's been the Golden Gate Bridge, the Panama Canal, the tunnels under the Hudson River into uh, downtown Manhattan, they all have two things in common. They all start with a vision, and they don't happen overnight. The interstate highway system, it started with eight lonely miles in the middle of rural Kansas with no direct connection to a major city. It took 10 administrations, 28 sessions of Congress, but year by year, piece by piece, as a nation, we got it done. So just like our work today for higher performing rail network, it was a multi-generational effort. We stayed committed to this effort because we knew it would propel our economy forward and meet the mobility needs of the 20th century. So today, we must commit to solving the challenges of a new century, those challenges of congestion, fuel utilization, air quality, and global warming. The next generation is counting on us. And years from now, when they study our actions and our choices, our successes or our failures, They'll look at the choices we made, taking into account all the knowledge we had. Will they say we got it right? With the commitment of President Obama, and with the talent, the energy, and vision of everybody in this room, I'm convinced that the answer will be yes. Thank you very much.